Okay, here's part two then of the climate controls and classifications part of the lecture. We're moving on now to our seven climate controls. I really like putting this stuff off until the end of the course in the eighth module because it does a good job of kind of being sort of like cumulative material in the course. It helps us understand how all the things that we've been learning all semester long kind of fit together. Um, broadly speaking, if we wanted to find a way to just say how do we decide what the climate of a region is like, there's broadly speaking seven main factors that control the climate of a region and they're listed there. Intensity of sunlight, distribution of land and water, uh, ocean currents, prevailing winds, position of highs and lows, mountain barriers and altitude. We're going to talk about each of these guys in uh, a little more detail. And let's start with the intensity of sunshine. This is actually kind of a review of stuff that you learned way back in the first module of the course where we were talking about these factors that are determining how much radiation a region is receiving from the sun at any given time. This is about things like the length of daylight. You know, the longer the sun is up, the more solar radiation you're receiving. It's also about things like beam spreading and sun angle, how high in the sky the sun is. This is all stuff that you had back in lecture one, and you're not, I'm back in module one, and you're not going to be expected to like, you know, solve those kinds of problems again or something like that. But we can be looking at examples like this, these uh, ones that I have on these slides right here, where you're seeing like uh, the differences in the sun angles at San Antonio, which is far to the south in Texas, versus Winnipeg, which is in Canada. And you can see how on given days, the sun angles are different and therefore the beam spreading is different. And you know, well, this is not exactly rocket science, right? I mean, obviously a location is gonna tend to be warmer the closer to the equator it is. In general, the lower the latitude, in other words, the closer to the equator a location gets, uh, is, the warmer the climate is. Well, that's, you probably didn't need a course to know that kind of stuff. Um, in general, that's going to be because the sun, the sun angles are higher is the primary reason. Although, um, in the winter, their days are longer than places that are at higher latitudes. Uh, so that also helps keep their climate warmer. Yes, low latitude lat locations are warmer overall, but there's actually a kind of a more interesting difference between uh, low latitudes and high latitudes with regard to climate. Low latitude locations also have a smaller difference between their climate in the winter and in the summer. Uh, and to, do, to talk about that, let me give you an example here. We're going to compare two cities in the United States. This is actually going to be kind of our model as to how we talk about this climate stuff. We're going to compare the climates of two locations at any given time. Today, uh, for the first one, for this first climate control, the intensity of sunshine, let's compare Miami to New York. Okay, Miami. Let's look at uh, what, what, do, what do we know from our experiences of just, you know, conventional wisdom about Miami. What's a good summertime temperature in Miami? Okay, Miami's not exactly a desert where, like, somehow or other the temperature might be 110 degrees Fahrenheit or something. A good, a good temperature in Miami might be in the 90s in the summer. Uh, on the other hand, a good wintertime temperature in Miami might be like in the 60s or something like that. It could be cooler than that in Miami, but if I wanted to say a good average wintertime temperature in Miami, I'll say the 60s. Miami's a fairly low latitude location in the United States. Let's compare that to someplace higher latitude, like New York City. Okay, what would be a good summertime temperature in New York? Well, New York gets pretty hot. It, it's certainly not as warm as Miami, but I think a fair guess of a typical summertime temperature in New York City. It might be in the 80s, maybe even low 90s. Um, on the other hand, what's a good wintertime temperature in New York? Well, like in the 20s would be a perfectly reasonable and certainly could be much colder than that. See how the temperature difference between winter and summer in Miami is very different from the temperature difference of the winter, uh, between winter and summer in New York. The farther towards the equator you get, the lower the latitude of your location the smaller the difference is between winter and summer. Miami in this example was warmer overall, but it had a milder climate. The difference between the typical temperatures in the winter and in the summer was just smaller than it was at a higher latitude location like New York. So region, so this would be a good example uh, we could have picked any number of examples and that's the kind of thing that's actually going to happen on the quiz by the way. There'll be um, or on the homework, I believe, too, for that matter, where you'll be comparing two locations. And one possibility, if you want to talk about the difference between their climate, might be to think about them in terms of their latitude, not only in terms of overall the places closer to the equator tend to be warmer, but also they tend to have a smaller difference between winter and summer.
Okay, our second climate control is going to be the distribution of land and water. We're basically talking about how close to a major body of water is our location. Regions that are close to major bodies of water, like oceans, tend to have milder climates than places that are far inland. Um, let me give you two key vocabulary words here. Continental climate and marine climates. Places that are far inland tend to have more continental climates. There's going to be a bigger difference between summer and winter. Winters are going to be colder and summers are going to be hotter than a place at a similar latitude but on the shore. Places on the shore then we would describe as having a more marine climate. Let me give you an example. The classic example of the difference between continental climates and marine climates would be to compare Fargo, North Dakota to Seattle, Washington. As it happens, Fargo and Seattle are at approximately the same latitude. All things being considered, you might think they would have very similar climates, right? I mean, they're at about the same latitude. They should have the same average temperature. They get the same amount of sunlight. And um, they should have roughly the same difference between their wintertime temperature and their summertime temperatures. Their annual cycle of temperature should be about the same. Well, let's take a look. Let's think about Seattle for a moment, okay? Um, Seattle has a very... Um, sorry, I think my slides got off here a little bit. Uh, Seattle has a very lovely summer time. Uh, you know, their temperatures might be like in the 70s or something like that. And in the winter, it hardly ever snows or even freezes there. Their, high temp their typical temperature in the winter might be in the 40s or something like that. Compare that to Fargo. Fargo, you know, it's relatively far north, but it certainly can still be in the 80s and 90s in the summer. On the winter, on the other hand, in Fargo, oh yeah, it gets really, really cold in, in Fargo. Uh, you know, I don't know what the average high temperature is in, say, January in Fargo, but I'm guessing maybe in the teens, something like that. Even though they're at the same latitude, Fargo and uh, Seattle have very different climates. It's because Fargo has a very continental climate and Seattle has a very marine climate. We would say then that they're at the same latitude, but they have very different climates. Seattle's very mild, with relatively little difference between its summer and its wintertime temperatures, whereas Fargo has a very extreme climate. It is very continental. It is warmer in the, uh, in the summer and it is colder in the winter. Okay, let's consider a third climate control. We're going to talk about ocean currents. Now, we're talking about, again, kind of our model here is to compare two locations that are similar and we want to know how their climates are different. All right, we can talk about two locations that are at the same latitude and maybe they're both on the coast. But what their climate is going to be like is going to depend on the ocean currents around them. Now I have a map here of the ocean currents uh, of the world. All of the world's oceans rotate in these big ocean circulations. They're called gyres. Uh, that, I don't think that word appears on the, on the test. If, notice if it's on the, in the review sheet. If it's on the review sheet, you should know that word gyre. These big ocean circulations are called gyres. Anyway, the oceans rotate in such a way that all of the west coasts of continents have relatively cold ocean currents and all of the east uh, uh, coasts of continents have relatively cold currents. It has to do with the fact that all of the oceans are being controlled by the subtropical highs that sit on top of them, but that's more of an oceanography class kind of question. But, you know, if you uh, think of your experiences of locations that are on the coast, you can get a sense of how different the climates are based on the ocean currents right off there. Like here, I didn't actually label any specific cities, but like you can see I've put two dots on locations that are at the same latitude and on the coast in the United States, but one's on the west coast and one's on the east coast, and they have very different climates. Let's say that west coast location was, say, San Francisco, and that east coast location would be maybe Washington, D.C. Okay, those are two locations that are at approximately the same latitude, and they're both on the ocean. They both have marine climates. You might think that they would have very similar climates, but the ocean currents are controlling their climates overall. Uh, the waters off San Francisco are very cold. If you want to go swimming off the coast of San Francisco, you need like a wetsuit. It's very cold current coming down from Alaska. Whereas in the East Coast, you're on the Gulf Stream, that warm coast current that comes up from the Gulf of Mexico. So the climate overall of Washington, D.C. is going to be a lot warmer than the climate of San Francisco, even though they're at the same latitude and they're both on the coast, 
because Washington DC is under the influence of a very warm ocean current, it's going to have a warm climate compared to something like San Francisco, which has a very cold climate. And you can see we could pick other pairs of locations, like I drew two locations there on uh, South America, and you would get the same sort of thing. There's a very cold current off, say, the coast of Peru and Chile in the uh, western side of South America, whereas on the east side, they're under the influence of a very warm tropical current, and they have a very different climate. Now, while we're thinking, though, about these influences of uh, the, on the climate, these climate controls, our fourth most important one is going to be the prevailing wind. Now, prevailing wind is like the average wind at a location in terms of where it's coming from. Now, that is a complicated idea because it's kind of controlled by ideas that we learned a couple of modules ago of like the general circulation, things like trade winds and the westerlies and so on. But there could also be local factors, you know, like maybe the winds tend to come from this location for some reason, they tend to flow off the mountains or whatever. And so we would have to give you what the prevailing winds of a location are. I wouldn't expect you necessarily to, you know, have known what direction is the average wind at some location. I would give you that information. And so, but the, but the prevailing wind tells us, even at the same latitude, even on the coastline, there would be, even if, uh, depending on the ocean currents of a region, etc., there would be different uh, climates depending on where the air is coming from. For example, let me give you this map here of the United States and its average distribution of precipitation. You can see, for example, that the west tends to be a lot drier and the east tends to be a lot more wetter and so on. And you might wonder why. But if I then superimposed on there what the prevailing winds across especially the southern United States are, it gets a whole lot more obvious. Because see, most of the southern United States has a prevailing wind. The most common, the average wind is out of the south. Well, in the southeast United States, that means that the wind is coming from the Gulf of Mexico, a lovely source region for moist air. So they have a great source of moisture right there. On the other hand, in the southwest United States, where the winds are also prevailing, winds are also from the south, we get air winds off the deserts of Mexico. We don't have as much moisture to work with. Of course, the climate is drier. In the same sort of way, we could have talked about like the temperatures of those regions, okay? You would expect, for example, uh, in the southeast United States for the temperatures to be lower than they would be in the southwest United States. Because again, the air is coming from a cooler place. I mean, the Gulf of Mexico is warm, but it's nowhere near as warm as the deserts of Mexico. So, you know, a place like Phoenix is going to be warmer, in part because its air is coming from hot deserts of Mexico, Versus a place like, say, I don't know, Jackson, Mississippi or something, where the air masses that are influencing it tend to be coming up from the relatively cool Gulf of Mexico. Another factor that would be a climate control, our fifth climate control, would be the position of highs and lows. This is more directly a general circulation thing where we're saying, you know, overall, if the general circulation is dictating that there's a high pressure system over a location, like the subtropical high, that's going to be influencing the climate over and above latitude, over and above how pro close you are to the coastline, etc. Uh, it's going to, you know, particularly, of course, be controlling, like, the precipitation. I mean, high pressure systems always result in a drier climate. Low pressure systems always result in a more moist climate. Again, you kind of have to use your knowledge of the general circulation or be given that kind of information on the test. Um, I, for example, if you're in a place where there's a, where the general circulation says that there's going to be high pressure, you can expect your climate to be drier even if you're near water, okay? Uh, similarly, even if you're under a, you know, relatively far from a source of moisture, if you're persistently under an area of low pressure, like the ITCZ, you would expect to have a more moist climate. Let me give you an example here. Okay, I have a little map here, and a circular region here. It's a part of Africa, and, oh look, it's right there on the coast. I bet it has a lovely marine climate. It's probably very moist, very cool, okay? Um, everything that we learned so far about general circulation and climate controls would suggest that this would have a relatively moist climate, except this location happens to be the nation of uh, Western Sahara, which is under the subtropical highs, and therefore, even though it's relatively moist, and so on, there's large-scale sinking motion, very stable conditions. It almost never rains in Western Sahara. Even though it's right there by the... Uh, by the coast, and you might think it would have a marine climate, it actually has a very dry climate because of the large-scale sinking associated with the subtropical highs, which are right there. In the same sort of way, here's a map of Brazil. 
Um, I circled a region that is thousands of kilometers away from the Atlantic or the Pacific Oceans. Oh my goodness, this must be a very um, dry place, right? I mean, it's very far from a source of moisture. Well, except for the fact that it's basically at the equator. It's under the ITCZ, an area of low pressure. We have very moist conditions here, and of course, that's not terribly surprising to you because you can see this is clearly the Amazon jungle, right? Um, so, I mean, even though we're far from a source of water vapor, the large-scale low-pressure systems and rising motions and so on mean that we're continuously reworking water vapor in the atmosphere and producing precipitation even far from an ocean. Our sixth climate control is going to be mountain barriers. Mountain barriers are uh, a really interesting influence on climate. This goes back again in a couple of modules where we learned about how when you lift air over a mountain range, uh, you have on the windward side of the mountain, you have a cooler and more moist climate, whereas uh, on the lee side of the mountains, you have a drier and warmer climate. And again, I have a little schematic here just to remind you of those lectures from a couple modules ago. The classic example of the influence of mountain ranges on climate would be comparing two cities in Washington state, Seattle and Yakima. Now, Seattle and Yakima are at approximately the same latitude. Yakima is a little farther south, but basically the same latitude, and they're both, you know, within a hundred kilometers or something of the ocean, you would think they'd have relatively marine climates. But what separates them is a range of mountains. Uh, I always forget if those are the Olympics or the Cascades. Um, but they are two very different climates because when the winds, the, persist, the prevailing winds in that region are from the west, and so when the winds approach Seattle, they are flowing up the mountain range, and so Seattle has a relatively cool and moist climate compared to Yakima, which is on the lee side of the mountains, which is a very a hot and dry climate uh, compared to Seattle. Um, you know, Seattle is very green. It's the Emerald City uh, to, is the marketing slogan for the uh, for Seattle. Yakima, I don't think they have a marketing slogan, but it would be, I don't know, it's hot and dry here. I don't know. It's a, a very, you know, they grow things in Yakima, like potatoes and stuff like that, but it's all irrigated because uh, it's too hot and dry there for it to be uh, to have get much precipitation. Now, our seventh and final climate control in this part of the lecture then would be altitude. All else being equal, higher locations have colder temperatures and lower locations have warmer temperatures. Now. If you've ever seen a picture of a tall mountain, you already kind of knew that. I mean, obviously, as you go higher and higher up the mountain, it gets colder and colder, and eventually, like, you know, you get snow-covered peaks and all that, and you get above the tree line where it's too cold for trees to grow and all that kind of good stuff. Now, that's a fairly extreme example. You don't have to be up a mountain for altitude to still be a major factor that is controlling your climate. For example, here's some maps of Nebraska. On one of the maps there, I've got the altitude map of Nebraska. In case you didn't know, basically, eastern Nebraska is low, and western and northern Nebraska is fairly high. And you compare that to a map of the average temperature in Nebraska, and it looks pretty much the same. I mean, in Nebraska, one of the major things that control the average temperature is just how high you are above sea level. Eastern Nebraska is overall warmer than western and northern Nebraska principally because it's, it's lower. In fact, if you think about it, just lifting the air parcels by the dry adiabatic lapse rate, I mean, if you have air at the surface in, say, Omaha in eastern Nebraska, if you just push that along the ground to, towards Wyoming, it's going to gain a couple thousand feet of altitude, and if you actually work that out using the dry adiabatic lapse rate, you figure out, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's actually quite a bit colder in western uh, Nebraska just because of the change in altitude of the air parcels. Okay, before we move forward uh, to our third part of the lecture, which is going to be about climate classification, I wanted to ask you one more question here. Um, I got a map there where I have two cities labeled. One is Atlanta, Georgia, and a second one is Myrtle Beach, right there on the coast in uh, South Carolina. And it says here, this map shows the locations of Atlanta and Myrtle Beach. In the summer, that's the important part of the question here, in the summer, you expect higher temperatures in which city due to its blank. Okay, so look at your, your four choices there and pick one and then use the links below this video to uh, answer the question and I'll give you some feedback before we move on to the third part of the lecture.